afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Louisiana State Archives. I am very excited to introduce our speaker. We've talked quite a lot over the last couple of months, um, and it's just so great to meet her. So Dr. Anna Rashley is the Assistant Professor of Professional Practice in the School of Library and Information Science at Louisiana State University. She earned her PhD from the College of Information at the University of North Texas. Her dissertation focused on participatory archive initiatives while her wider research entrants include community archives, digital humanities, and collective memory. After receiving her BA in English from the University of Texas at Austin, she earned an MS in Library and Information Science and an MA in History from Simmons College. Before entering her PhD program, she worked in the Downs Jones Library and Archives at Houston Tillerson University. She has won the University of North Texas IS Academic Excellence PhD Award and is the inaugural winner of the Dewey E. Carroll Graduate Fellowship. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rosley. I want to thank you all so much for being here. I'm really, really honored to have been invited and I'm really honored to be here. I want to thank the Louisiana State Archives for inviting me to give this talk. I am just so incredibly beyond words thankful. Um, I also want to acknowledge that I am presenting to you from the traditional land of the Chatayakni people. And I do want to acknowledge that much of my research was done on the lands of the Massachusetts, Pawtucket, Poconocet and Wampanoag peoples. I pay my respect to the many indigenous peoples still connected to these lands. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, so today I am here to talk to you about participatory archives and specifically what participatory archives mean for archivists and communities of ordinary people who may not have been engaged with the archives in the past. I have several of my archival students here, which I'm really excited about, um, and they can tell you how much I really love to talk about the archival paradigm shifts. And this movement for participatory archiving is really what the late Terry Cook referred to as the community paradigm of archives. Um, so much of the traditional archives field, as I'm sure all of you know, in North America in many, and also in many other places was rooted in the documentation of government records, government archives, and of powerful members of society. Um, there were, and frankly, there continue to be significant gaps in official archival records regarding groups and individuals who do not occupy spaces of power or visibility in dominant society. Furthermore, often, even when the records or other materials of marginalized communities are included in archival collections, community members have very little or no control over how their records are accessed or how they are described in finding aids. <clears throat> um, or how they're described in exhibits and so on. So I'm sure you know this is not surprising because when we look at how some of these records and materials were initially acquired, we see that they were often outright taken from the community against the will of the community members. However, the field has slowly, very slowly, uh, been changing to recognize what community memory workers have long known, that there is a wide world of records in very many formats, not just paper records, created by many individuals and communities. And these records are just as imbued with what we call enduring archival value as the records of government organizations and powerful individuals. However, there's also been a growing and long overdue recognition in the field that these records are not just ours for the taking. Rather, we are coming to see that communities should decide what happens to their own records. So while many of the changes in the professional field have been very slow, they've helped shape the development of archival theory and practice into the 21st century. So in 2013, Terry Cook argued that we are entering a new archival paradigm in which, quote, archivists work in the community to encourage archiving as a participatory process shared with many in society, rather than necessarily acquiring all the archival product, products in our established archives, end quote. So this is where we find this movement of community-based archives and participatory archives that I wanna to talk to you about. 
after I sip some water. <laughs> okay, so specifically, one product of this paradigm shift are the archives that I'm really, very frankly, obsessed with. <laughs> These are, and it's a mouthful, event-based mediated participatory archives. And this is the archives that this whole study is about, that my whole life is about, basically. So these are archives that include significant participation from individuals and communities that the rec archival records in the archive are created by, or individuals that the records are about. So unlike independent community archives, however, these are not independently run by community members. Rather, the archival work is mediated by a traditional archival institution. In these archival initiatives, record collecting occurs via collection day events where participants are invited to bring their records for contribution to the archive. And these are usually um, post-custodial archives. So individuals will bring their records to be digitized and housed in the archive in that way, and they get to take their records home with them. So I have some examples written here of participatory initiatives, um, including our marathon, whose website you're seeing here in the picture. So this was a co collaboration between Northeastern University and members of the Boston community who were affected by the marathon bombing. Um, so another example is Harvey Memories, uh, which documents Hurricane Harvey survivors. This was an, an initiative um, out of several university archives in Houston, um, including Rice and University of Houston. Um, so you also will see the virtual Foot Locker here, which is a participatory archive initiative started by someone I think several of us consider a, mem a mentor, Dr. Ed Benoit at LSU SLIS. Um, so these are not all event-based archives, but they can give you an idea of really this movement is gaining ground. <laughs> So um, a little bit of background, I really, really became obsessed with this type of archival initiative when I was getting my MLIS and History Masters at Simmons College. So I became a volunteer in a participatory archive uh, in events through UMass Boston's Mass Memories Roadshow. So I became a volunteer in these events spent my Saturdays with them, and I really loved it. I loved being able to talk to ordinary people, many of whom were immigrants and even refugees, like myself and my own family. Um, these people came to share their records and their family histories with the archives and with their communities at these events. This was such a different experience with archives than my internship at the Boston Athenaeum was. Um, at the Athenaeum, I was processing records of very wealthy and powerful men from the 19th century. And while I was very interested in these records at the Athenaeum, and I'm very grateful for the experience and all I learned, my experiences in mass memories, talking to archival participants about how their family stories and memories made me realize how important archives are to the everyday lives of every person. So archival records, it made me realize that archival records do not just document the past. They live as a part of us. They shape our interactions with the world. So in these participatory archive events, I would see people cry as they share their stories with archive staff and volunteers as they describe you know, the stories tied to their contributed records. I and other archive staff or volunteers would often be moved to tears ourselves. Um, there was something intangible present at these events, a feeling of connection, a feeling that something was happening here something magical. So then when it came time to get my PhD, I pretty much right away knew this is what I want to do. I want to explore participatory archives. Specifically, I wanted to understand the relationship between these participants who donated their records and institutional archives. I wanted to understand the dynamics at play here. But then there was an issue. So I was really excited to dig in because I saw there was more and more of these initiatives happening and surely there was already a ton of work on how these relationships between archives and participants serve both participants and archives. Surely someone's done a ton of work on this. Um, bad news. I immediately ran into a problem. Uh, the bulk of the research on the community paradigm of archives is really concentrated on independent community archives, which is great. Like, we need more of that research. 
Um, but I was interested, what about archives, like institutional archives? How do they reach out to communities? What are those relationships like? And I found articles about like the logistics, like here's a case study, this is what we did. But there was nothing about, hey, what's happening here? What's at play? I was able to find one single article by Cushing, one of my heroes, that examined the motivations of participants in event-based mediated participatory archives. Just one article. Um, so I realized that because these initiatives are fairly new to mainstream archival scholarship, there was a real need for more research into the initiatives. Um, and because there is very little research beyond the logistics of this work, I realized fairly early on, it's very unclear how archival institutions can best connect to and serve the communities of ordinary people that they're trying to reach through these initiatives. Um, and these initiatives, you know, they take a lot of, a lot of work. They take money. It's, it's a long planning process. So it's worth knowing, hey, what's at play here? How do we best understand the people here? Um, so I set out to center my research around this problem. Um, and I decided to use Jeanette Bastian's community of records and memory concept as the main theoretical framework for this study. So I chose this framework because it was the closest to articulating the dynamics I was seeing at these participatory community events. So Jeanette explained, Dr. Bastian explains <laughs> that records tie members of a community to each other and to their memories. She says, quote, layers of records parallel the active life of the community itself, end quote. And that is really what I was seeing at these events, living communities of records and memory. So when applied to these event-based mediated participatory archives, this framework really provided me a way to investigate the layers and intersections of participatory action and personal records in the collection day setting and then in the resulting archival records. So my problem really led me directly to my purpose and these research questions. So using the community of records and memory framework, um, I worked to examine how community participants and archives personnel, archives, archive staff, volunteers, um, construct communities of records and memory. And I came up with three research questions. Uh, which my students know I'm, I'm obsessed with research questions, <laughs> um, to really push this project through. Um, and they were my guide, my northern star for this project. So my first question was, what motivations and intentions do community participants bring to these archives? And how did these motivations correspond to the archive staff, personnel's intentions for the project? Um, that's one thing I was really curious about. Um, People, participants were talking about it. The staff was talking about it. I was like, are y'all talking about the same thing? <laughs> Do you, are the goals lining up here? <laughs> um, because I didn't know. Uh, and sometimes from the sounds of it, I was like, I don't know if you want the same thing out of this. Um, then my second question was, how do community participants use their contributed records to represent themselves and their communities in these, in these archives? Um, and then, I wanted to know what role does the in-person collection day event play in the construction of communities of records and memory and these archives? There was something about those events, something that made me keep going. Even after I like moved from Massachusetts, I moved to Texas and I would fly out to do the events and volunteer at them. Um, so to actually conduct the study, I decided to go back to where this obsession began, the Mass Memories Roadshow. Um, this is, as I mentioned, an event-based project from the University Archives and Special Collections Unit at the University of Massachusetts Boston's Joseph P. Healy Library. So since 2004, the Mass Memories Roadshow has held 55 Collection Day events in different communities throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. At these roadshows, community participants contribute physical records, usually photographs, which are digitized, and oral histories, which are recorded during the day itself. Um, the roadshow communities are really self-defined and can be uh, location-based, like this is our town, this is our community, we want the Mass Memories Roadshow to come here, 
or they're based on a theme that unifies a community. So one example of a themed roadshow is the World War II Experiences Roadshow. Um, so this was a roadshow um, created by a local veterans group and they invited the Mass Memories Roadshow, they applied for it and they had a themed roadshow. So Roadshow Collection Day events rely on the participation of two groups, archives personnel and community participants, and I realize I need to understand both. <laughs> um, archives personnel include professional archivists, archival interns, public historians, and other cultural heritage professionals who are affiliated with the Healy Archives. Um, so community participants are members of communities who participate in Mass Memories Roadshows in their communities. Um, so their participation levels can really vary. Um, some are involved with contacting UMass and applying for the roadshow and planning the whole thing and helping organize. And others, their participation is limited to, I'm coming in on this day, I'm contributing my records, and that's it. So the study took place over three phases. Um, so phase one of data collection relied on documentary sources that provide background information about the roadshow and the people involved with the project. Um, so data in this phase was analyzed using against the grain historical analysis methods using that history degree finally. Um, and these materials were used to address questions about motivations and about the event. Um, so in phase two, I used the materials from the Mass Memory Roadshow digital collections. Um, and these included the recorded oral history interviews that were created at the roadshows, as well as transcripts of description field metadata records, which community participants created themselves to describe their contributed records. Um, so these, uh, all these phase two data were used to address questions about the event and about participants relationships to their records. Um, and then finally, in phase three, two ethnographic approaches, direct observation and semi-structured interviews of both archives personnel and community participants were used. Um, so the observation, uh, where I went and I observed and took notes, um, like a freak in the background. <laughs> um, it really addresses question three about the event, um, while the semi-structured interviews were used to address all three questions. Okay, so finally, my favorite part. It's time to talk about my findings, because I think they're really interesting, and I hope you do too. Uh, so my first question asked, what motivations and intentions do participants bring to these archives, and how do these correspond to the archive personnel's intentions for the project? Um, so in phase one, the primary source materials authored by archives personnel stress over and over and over again how important inclusive community building and collection building is for them. How important it is to, quote, celebrate each person's family history and contribution to the community, whether they have lived there for generations or are recently arrived, um, end quote. So the archives was really making it clear that they wanted this to be inclusive of many people and not just the founding families of the town. So I don't know how familiar you are with Massachusetts. There's a lot of attention paid to the, the revolution. <laughs> and um, the pilgrims. Um, and what the archive staff really wanted was hey, that's not all the history we have here. Let's make it a little more inclusive. So they were like, yes, everyone, everyone comes. Ev like, if this is a community art, you know, community-based participatory archive based in, you know, this town, everyone in the town should come. However, <laughs> um, sometimes applications created by community participants who wanted the roadshow to come to their communities, there is often less of a focus on those who are newly arrived. And when I was looking through their archives and looking at old applications, this was very evident in the older um, events. Uh, so for example, many roadshows are framed as parts of town anniversary celebrations. Um, so for example, the town will be celebrating, like, oh, we were, we were chartered as a town 375 years ago and we're going to do a whole series of events why don't we invite the roadshow as well and then we can you know get more history 
Um, but then you see how they're framing it, right? Um, here in this quote, you see in the Wayland application, it says, quote, a primary goal of our 375th celebration is this is to highlight Wayland's history and contribution to the Commonwealth and the nation, end quote. So the town members who were participating um, in, in, in the planning stages were really focusing on the founding families and uh, versus those who just arrived. You, even though it's not super overt, and it actually gets more overt in the deeper you look in the files, um, just this framing maybe doesn't go along with the archive staff being like, hey, let's invite everyone. Let's make this as inclusive as possible. How can we do that? Um, so the use of against the grain methods, and here you can see a quote from an email um, from a member of the archives personnel to one of the planners, um, really show that there's like a tension and a friction. So many of these email passages demonstrate how the archives personnel negotiate with community participants on the planning team to help encourage inclusion of more members of the community than may be included in the application stage. So this was actually a really important part be inclusive at the planning stage, because it's not just a person who applies that like once the roadshow is approved, it, you need a whole bunch of planners. You need a lot of people. And trying to make sure like, let's get those people in right away because then you might see their friends and families feel welcome rather than just being like, oh, we're a bunch of you know nice little old white ladies, which love them. Um, and related to many of them, um, but <laughs> like, and just being like, oh, we're all the same, you know, we're all like retirees and we are just the same. Oh, you're welcome to, your community as well. Yeah, y'all should come, right? There's a difference between saying like, oh, that's my aunt. I'm going to go because, you know, she's my aunt, so I'll go too. Or like, that's my church member and so on. Okay. So in phase three, when I was examining, um, so when I was doing the interviews, um, I was examining the motivations and intentions of community participants. Um, the, my recursive analysis of, it, of their interview data shows that their participation in the archives is really tied to feelings of self-fulfillment. Um, meanwhile, archives personnel stress community building, collection building, and creating inclusive collections. Um, while community participants are like, I want to document me. I want to document my family. However, even though I mentioned that friction earlier, these quotes here also show how these intentions from the two factions can be very symbiotic. So community participant one, who, whose quote you see here, whose parents are immigrants, she said, quote, I wanted the local community that was very established group of families to know our family's impact on the town. I wanted them to know that we're not very different and that we bring a lot to the table in whatever differences we have, end quote. Um, and then archives personnel member one said, Quote, there's a goal of community engagement and people learning from one another who they are. And so that second goal is really to build a digital collection that documents the people of the state of Massachusetts or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in their own words, end quote. Um, so these findings show that community participants were very cognizant about the importance of how historical records are shaped. And they wanted to actively participate and shape these historical records. They wanted their families to be included. Um, so in her work on global anthropology, Anatha Singh uses the concept of friction to, quote, focus on zones of awkward engagement, end quote. And I found this really helpful in helping me understand these, negotiation, these negotiations happening between archives personnel and community participants. These are zones of friction but they do not have to end in stalemates. They can result in growth. So I want to talk a little bit more about the implications of all this. So while community participant motivations for contribution to the archives are really rooted in self-fulfillment, they still vary. Um, so organizations using participatory approaches need to understand these motivations and to really appeal to them. 
Um, and we also need to very seriously interrogate the ways in which participatory initiatives are both inclusive of communities and repeat the harms of exclusion, the very harms they are trying to overcome. In the Mass Memories Roadshow, the archives personnel saw that focusing only on location-based roadshows could be limiting, so they started focusing on thematic roadshows, um, like the pub Boston Public Housing Roadshow, the Chinese American Experiences Roadshow, and so on. So in my second question, I asked, how do community participants use their contributed records to represent themselves and their communities in these archives? Um, so in their oral history interviews, community participants were prompted to speak about their contributed records. Um, so grounded theory analysis of these resulted in 20 focus codes that are presented in the table here. These codes were grouped into three categories, the self, community, and archival records. Um, so though community participants were discussing their records, um, the records catalyzed stories about themselves, about their families, and their communities. So the describing family code is particularly notable as it's present in 68% of the oral history interviews. So in the oral history interviews, we see these deeply, deeply personal connections and ties that community participants relate to their contributed records. So for example, a Hyde Park Roadshow community participant described her contributed record as such, quote, this is a picture of my mom. I love this one with all my heart. We, we recently took another picture and this portrays how much I really do look like my mom. And it's awesome when, we, when people say, you look like your mother. I take that as a huge compliment, end quote. So this is just a small excerpt of her oral history where they ask her like, oh, what records did you bring today? That's the prompt, right? And she just spends the whole time talking about her mom. Um, like the records are important because they represent her mom. So next is the metadata. Um, so an important aspect of the Mass Memories Roadshow is that community participants are also asked to contribute their description field metadata for their contributed records. I highly recommend this if you're gonna do something like this. Highly recommend it. In these, community participants are asked to describe their records and why they're important. And that's what goes in that Dublin Core description, like description field, right? Um, and overwhelmingly, participants focus on the context and personal stories related to the records rather than the content of the records. And I'm gonna give you one of my favorite examples. So the contextual information provided by community participants in their description field metadata entries is not presented as objective, but is highly individual and sometimes intimate. Uh, so while they may present information that relates to wider sociopolitical events of the past, this information is valuable because of how it relates to the participants' personal experiences. So at the Boston Harbor Islands Roadshow, several participants contributed photographs of Italian prisoners of war who were confined to one of the islands during World War II, which I had no idea about, um, even though I used to go to the Boston Harbor Islands. Um, so. However, all of their metadata descriptions are related to their personal stories and connections regarding the prisoners rather than like really any geopolitical commentary. So for example, quote, this is a picture of the Italian prisoners of war who were regular visitors to our cottage every Saturday and Sunday, came to dinner to play cards and to talk about their home in Italy, end quote. I was like, what? <laughs> right? Um, so this was very surprising to me, and I had a lot of questions, but I can't get derailed by that. But I really, really want to say that this picture is just an example of how records are contributed, not because of, you know, like any wider, like, oh, this is newsworthy, this is history worthy, um, any political implications of the status of the POWs, but because they came to the participants' cottage. That's why this picture is important. This is my tie to them and this, this item. Um, one person contributed records of Italian POWs and was talked about her grandpa the whole time because her grandpa became friends with them. So then 
in my semi-structured interviews, I found that across the board, community participants used records to share personal stories and connect records to their personal memories. They also used records as evidence and part of their historical legacy. So in describing her contribution of records that document her family, community participant two said, quote, I felt very grateful. I felt that all of this is such a wonderful experience to be able to submit something. And now that's going to be archived and it could be shown and it's in the history. And it kind of got me more interested in probably looking into my own family's, I guess you say legacy in the United States, end quote. Um, so in seeing how community participants use and understand their contributed records, they contribute records that center themselves or their families in their communities. Um, so the focus on community through a personal lens speaks to this idea that Dr. Bastian talked about of societal provenance in communities of records and memory. Though community participants work to connect records to memories in deeply personal ways, their records and memories are situated not only in the personal realm, but within the wider communities as well. So, I want to talk about more implications for our field. <laughs> um, so as many of you know, Cook explained, and my students should know because I made you read this article, <laughs> um, Cook explained that archival paradigms have shifted from evidence to memory to identity to community. However, this evidentiary function is still highly relevant and important to archival participants in the community paradigm. It's really important to participants that having their records in an archive means that there's evidence of their family and that their family is a part of the history of the community. Um, so I also wanna talk about this idea of archival value for a little bit. The Mass Memories Roadshow provides an actionable example of what Marika C4 first al alerted us to, effective archival value as a primary appraisal criterion. Um, and this is, I think, very cool because the people who are appraising these records are the community participants themselves. As community participants are the ones who are appraising them and often do it based on affect and their emotional connection to the records, we're, we're seeing affective archival value in action. We do not have to do this on our own. Uh, we have to work with community members to do it. Uh, we just need to invite communities of records creators into the appraisal process. My final research question is about the event itself, and I ask, what role does the in-person collection day event play in the construction of communities of records and memory in these event-based mediated participatory archives? So back in phase one, when I was looking at materials authored by archives personnel, these show that the day is created in ways which are very, very deliberate. The space is set up in such a way that each individual community participant can be drawn into other stories as people are telling them and into other people's records as they experience the day. So for example, archives personnel explained that, quote, the digital collection serves to mirror the community back to itself, end quote. And this process begins at the collection day event where the, where quote, we project all photos on a wall screen, and you can see that here, um, as they are being scanned and arrange seating so that contributors can listen to other stories as they, they are being recorded, end quote. So the oral history is happening right there in the room and people can overhear each other. So another thing to note is how the language used by archives personnel really echoes uh, Jeanette Bastian's descriptions of communities of records and memory. Archives personnel work to design the day as one in which communities gather to create collections that mirror the actions of the community itself, including their actions on the collection day, which too becomes a part of the digital collection. So, in the roadshow planning materials, including emails written by community participants after the collection day event occurred, um, these planning materials often show the effective power of the collection day event. Um, so I have a quote here for you that is from uh, an email that was written by one of the participants who contributed to the Chinese American Experience Mass Memories Roadshow. After her experience at the roadshow, she wrote this email to archives personnel and other community participants who volunteered at the event. And she said, quote, our parents and grandparents lived in the community 
Chinatown, Boston, Massachusetts, America, at a time when few people owned a camera, so not many photos exist, especially relative to what our children have in today's world, thousands. And because of the exclusion laws, as well as discriminatory acts they might have faced while carving out a living, there were few family stories shared with us, or the stories were couched in secretive detail that escaped us while we were growing up. Being able to share the stories and photos helps us learn from one another, and even helps explain some of the mysteries surrounding our families. It's like being a detective, uncovering information, clues to our own histories, end quote. So when I read that, I was like, she, she did it. That's, she articulated this magic that I've been seeing. Um, so the roadshow as an event was key to this participant's experience as it allowed her to, quote, share stories and to learn from one another. Um, so in their work on archival representation, um, Caswell, C4, and Ramirez refer to, quote, the profound personal implications of being seen in the archival record. And this really illustrates those profound implications. So the event itself was also addressed in some of the phase two data from the oral histories, which was really interesting because those were being recorded at the day. Um, so the roadshow itself is happening around the community participants as they're, you know, telling their stories in the oral histories. So it's, you know, not that surprising that they're going to bring it up. Uh, so when giving his oral history interview, a Provincetown community participant asserted that the Roadshow event com shows community members that their stories are important while re reaffirming community ties as everyone shares their stories. He said, oh, other people find it fascinating. The fact that, oh, your father was a fisherman. Oh, he fell over and he was, oh, it's also interesting. So I think that inspires people to say, wait a minute, my family does matter, end quote. So overall, my analysis of the oral history interviews of community participants showed me that 11% of them actually addressed the Collection Day event itself as it's happening around them. They're not just talking about the past, about their records, they're talking about the day as they're living it. Um, so we're seeing how the participatory archive day itself becomes a part of the archival record. Um, so in phase three, I did a direct observation of the Plymouth Roadshow. Um, and this addressed the, this observation really addressed this question at length. Um, so here you see the layout of the room where the event occurred. Um, the layout of the room is designed for the flow of traffic with the purpose that we saw in, in the phase one findings. It's really designed to allow people to overhear each other and share their stories with each other. Uh, but something that's not included here because it's outside the room, but it's towards the entrance, there was a huge poster advertising the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower landing on Plymouth Rock, indicating that this day is a part of that larger year-long celebration. So through this observation, it was so interesting, I found reoccurring themes of the roadshow as a physical environment and space. There were moments of purpose and also moments that were very spontaneous. Within this environment are planned and purposeful moments as well as those that are unexpected. At the center of, this day, of the day is this idea of human connection. So I witnessed a surprise interaction between old high school friends who had never seen each other for, or who had not seen each other for like decades. And that was very cool. They like freaked out and were giving each other hugs. However, I also witnessed or overheard a moment where a community participant something, said something that really surprised me. So he said, I really wish that there were members of the Wampanoag community here. And this too speaks to a possibility of human connection, a possibility that is unfulfilled. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. So while they have different roles to play, in my semi-structured interviews with both community participants and archives personnel, I really found their perceptions of the Collection Day event to be very similar, like strikingly similar. Their interviews all stress the role of the day in affirming community participants. Uh, they stress these moments of connection, the act of participation, and high emotions. 
Um, so we, here we see two examples of how members of both groups describe the day. So community participant four, who was an injured survivor of the Boston Marathon bombing, described her event where she participated as the first time she was truly heard after the bombing. She said, quote, I felt more included as a survivor and injured survivor of the Boston Marathon bombing than I ever had before because no one had ever wanted my story except for the FBI for medical purposes. It's like other than telling your doctor and legal people, I felt like no one else really cared. And I don't know if the roadshow is caring so much, but they care enough to document people's stories, stranger stories, end quote. So meanwhile, archives personnel member six um, mentioned that not only was the day emotional for community participants, but for her as well as she was working the day. Um, she worked the scanning station where archival records are scanned for digitization. So, and she said, quote, so it wasn't just like you sat there silently scanning their materials. It was like, oh, you would just get to meet a bunch of people and they would talk to you about memories that they had and why things were important to them. And it always felt really emotional. I think I cried a bunch, end quote. She did, she cried a bunch. <laughs> So something that I believe to be a fairly important implication for the field is this idea of who feels welcome to attend the road show, who feels welcome to attend these events that we put on. So Dr. Jamie Lee describes radically hospitable community archives, and I love this idea, as having a kitchen table ethos. And this is actually enacted through the facilitation of the Collection Day event. Like Dr. Lee's kitchen table, the Collection Day event allows community participants to come together and contemplate the ways in which they participate as historic actors within the archives and within their own communities. However, while the Roadshow Collection kitchen table may be hospitable to those at the table, it's not always inclusive. The ways in which Roadshow Collection Day events are organized can affect how inclusive the events are. So for example, several of the location-based roadshows, like I mentioned, were held as part of wider town initiatives to celebrate town anniversaries. And this includes Plymouth's year-long celebration of the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the Mayflower. Um, in a newspaper interview regarding the protest of Plymouth's Thanksgiving Day celebrations, Troy Currents of the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe said, Quote, my grandfather, he used to speak the language. It wasn't really cool to speak Wampanoag back then. You were shipped off the boarding schools where they cut your hair and didn't let you speak your language or practice your culture. Our way of life was outlawed to us. Personally for me, I never really went to Plymouth. Plymouth never really sat well with me. It wasn't until about 15 years ago that I got over that and was able to go. I didn't realize it at the time, but that's ancestral trauma, end quote. So, Kearns's quote sheds quite a bit of insight into how communities of records and memory, while bringing feelings of belonging and inclusion for some, also bring trauma and exclusion for others. We can't realistically expect our participatory initiatives to be more inclusive than they have been if they're centering the same history that has been archived before the initiative even started, right? So now, <laughs> let's get in into what to do now that I got some of these answers. Um, I think it's really important for me to know that there are a lot of limits to this study due to the data collection. Uh, the Mass Memories Roadshow is really geographically bound to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, so really further studies of participatory initiatives and other ge geographic locations are necessary. Uh, so another issue is that the recruitment of study participants was limited to archives personnel and community participants of past roadshows, leading to some demographic homogeneity. Uh, more of this type of work is really needed to understand this phenomenon on a wider scale. But beyond more work to understand these initiatives as communities of records, um, I also have some next steps um, that I think are very necessary, and that's to examine uh, current and future use of these emerging digital archive collections. And I think it's really important to analyze how and if <laughs> moments of spontaneous connection and discovery, which are really present at Collection Day events, um, can be replicated in the digital environment once the archive is digitized and accessed remotely. Um, and also, there's really little understanding of how to tie, 
tailor the user experience of digital archives for both communities of participants and traditional researchers. Um, and as more participatory archive collections are created, I think it's important to understand how these collections can be preserved and sustained by archival institutions. So I'll, I know we all know that much of the research on archival preservation um, focuses, especially of digital collections, focuses on institutional and research repositories. Um, so I think it would be really interesting to broaden that focus. I think several questions need to be addressed regarding the preservation of such digital collections, uh, like the Mass Memories Roadshow, and what considerations do we have? What considerations do we need to take for long-term preservation in participatory archives? Um, and then I also really, I'm really curious about how to serve the needs of users who are not, who don't necessarily, who have more diverse um, technological needs and understanding of technology than the traditional research community. Finally, <laughs> I also want to leave you with this. Uh, though institutional archives uphold societal power structures, as I think we all know, they also have the capability to promote archival plurality. And the study shows that event-based mediated participatory archive projects have the potential to do just this. They are also very complicated and nuanced communities of records and memory in which inclusion is negotiated. So the work of archival pluralization is really still aspirational and ongoing. If I have been able to stress one thing to you today, I hope it is that participatory archives are living communities made up of archivists, records, uh, and community participants. These initiatives are hard work. <laughs> There's so much relationship building involved and so much of sharing control, sharing power and authority, and so much of that is necessary to actually make them work. However, these initiatives have the potential to make archives incredibly relevant to people. These archives matter to the community participants who contribute their records. They act as evidence of their place in their community. For community participants, the records are personal, and so is their participation. That makes their relationships to our archives personal too. They become invested in our work. Participatory archives build relationships and they build communities. We just have to be willing to do this hard work. So I hope that today's talk makes the hard work seem like it's worth doing. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.